Welcome back to Long Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We have a lot to discuss today. We're covering multiple trials, and we're waiting to go live in a major trial here on the network. So we have a bunch of things to discuss. Let's get started. Okay, so the end of that witness, we're waiting for the next one. Joining me now is criminal defense attorney Roger Foley. Roger, great to see you. I want to start with you. Uh, you know, the, what kind of communications are you looking for right now between Crystal Cortez and Brenda Delgado? What kind of communications you're asking? I, I don't understand the question, Jesse. Well, here's the thing. This is a cell phone expert This who just took the stand. Now a new expert's going to be coming on. I imagine we're going to learn more about the communications, what was searched, what was text, what were the text messages. Maybe that's where we're going. Uh, what, what are you looking out for? Well, that, yeah, that's exactly what we'll be looking at, to, to see what kind of collaboration occurred between the two. Obviously, if they were talking, since most people in today's society are texting rather than talking, it makes sense that if they can get the, that communication, those texts or even emails, probably not emails, but possibly text. And also they can triangulate the, the, uh, the phones to determine where these people were at the times of the conversations leading up to the murder and shortly thereafter. Yeah, because as Holly and I said earlier, there's one thing to just take witness testimony for what it is. And yes, Crystal Cortez really laid out a case against Brenda Delgado. But if we can get some more concrete evidence, that would really help the case. I think we can jump back live. Uh, Michael Freeman, who's from the Dallas Police Department, just took the stand. So let's go live. OK, so Holly, let me ask you this. You know, a lot of times we cover trials and there are aspects of it that I think the public, their viewers are surprised at, that it doesn't always look like the movies. They have to set, set up a foundation for each one of these witnesses. And here you have somebody, we're trying to understand how cell phone data was extracted. How do you keep a jury interested? How do you keep a jury present? Because they're sitting there all day. And you know, here you're learning about how cell phone data is extracted. How do you keep them interested? You get in, you get right to the point, and you keep it short. Um, you explain it um, her, the guys. way you would explain it to a child, and not to degrade or be disrespectful to the jury, but they don't want to be bogged down with all of the scientific data behind it. Explain it in a clear, concise way and get away from this witness. I don't think anybody would be offended. That's what I want, too. I want it broken down like I'm a child. All right, this gives us an opportunity to break down this case a little bit. Roger, let me start with you. Uh, first time we've had an opportunity to talk about this case. What do you think about the prosecution's uh, evidence against the defendant so far? Well, and, and with this witness, I mean, they're trying to link it there. You, you were asking before, how do you spice this up? I mean, they're giving you little bits, right? There, there doesn't seem to be any phone conversation or text between the two, but there's a picture two days later, looks like maybe they're out shopping or whatever. So it's it's slowly pulling in the jury to say, hey, this is important. Look, these people are hanging out, but I think they're lacking in. I haven't heard anything about communications through text and phone calls between the two. They're just together, you know, two days after the murder. So, what is that telling you? Well, I guess we'll soon find out. Yeah, I mean, Holly, would you classify this as a circumstantial evidence case? I mean, you don't have Brenda Delgado at the scene overlooking the shooting and directing somebody. Uh, so is this a circumstantial evidence case? I certainly think that circumstantial evidence will come into play, but you do uh, have direct evidence from both the shooter and the getaway driver. What I'm interested in seeing and what I'm confused why the state hasn't put forth, show me all of the calls and the text messages that Cortez testified to between herself and Delgado. Well, maybe we're going to get there. They're laying the foundation of it. Um, maybe we could jump back live right now to see what's going on and see what this officer is reviewing. Again, these this could be a way to tie the defendant uh, even more directly. So let's go live. All right. So let's take a quick break. But before we do, I have to sign off Holly Waltman. Holly, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your insight. Thanks, Jesse. Great to be here. Great to have you. All right. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back right after this. Okay, so we're learning more about what was on Brenda's phone. What was she thinking about? What was she looking about? Who was she communicating with? Roger, what are you getting a sense of here? Jesse, I mean, it, it's pretty clear that she's watching the ex-boyfriend. She looks like that's probably his social security card. She's looking at flight plans, what he's doing. She's looking at pictures with, with his new girlfriend. Um, she's obviously, you know, people would say that, that she's stalking him. Maybe it's secretly, but but she's stalking, she's following, she's in his business, although their relationship is over. Also the timeline. This is only a few months 
uh, before September when the killing takes place. So there's that level of plotting and looking at that red Mitsubishi, which we thought that she was uh, going to buy for the murder as well. De de definitely possible. Um, I, they'll link it up as they go. The text messages and the, the conversations will, will come out. But right now, the, the, the prosecution is just setting up everything so when they can use it in their closing arguments. Are you surprised how sloppy this, uh, you know, this looks? I mean, the idea that she was asking people to help with this plot and then what's on her cell phone. Are you surprised at the level of sloppiness of this whole, uh, this whole scheme or this alleged scheme? You know, I... I don't know that anyone uh, truly plots a murder, and it's not like the movies. And, you know, what we were talking about before, right. there's not a lot of aha moments. Usually when people commit crimes, I mean, they say that they, they make hundreds or thousands of mistakes, especially in, in murder cases. So um, obviously she's not very clever if this is what she was doing. Absolutely. Okay, so Roger, let me ask you this. The prosecution, we see what they're doing here, trying to show a an obsessed ex-girlfriend that was tracking both her ex and his new girlfriend and plotting, and we get it. What is the defense going to do when they have an opportunity to cross-examine this witness? I mean, where would you go? Well, they're going to look for any inconsistencies in, in his statement. They're going to really look at all those documents that he said it's almost impossible to go through one by one, and they're going to look at, at that tracking software and exactly how it works. And, and try to get him a little discombobulated in it because a lot of people use a program, but they may not know the inner workings of it. So that their the mistakes could happen um, and locations. But generally speaking, I think that the, the prosecution is doing a, a great job at setting up that obviously these three people knew each other. They had time to talk. They had time to plan. And that's where the theme of their case is going, that this was a planned out execution. Yeah, and I'm curious to see, you know, which way the defense is going to go and say, well, they might have known each other, they might have been in contact with each other, but at the end of the day, this was a decision uh, from Crystal and Christopher. It was their decision, um, and really, you can't show that Delgado directed them in any way, knew what was happening, and I'm curious to see if that's the way they'll go and which way they're going to go when they cross-examine this witness. Let's take a quick break on our end. When we come back, we're going to be live, and we're going to break down more of our trials that we're covering here on Long Crime. We'll be right back right after this.